Like I said today once, um, third time is the charm. So this sassy meeting uh, was supposed to happen in 2020 and then in 2021 and now we're in 2022. And look, thanks to technology, we are able to do this in a hybrid mode for just very special panels <laughs> on the program. So it is my absolute pleasure to um, invite us all to discuss Jordana McClone's terrific new book, A Man Among Other Men, The Crisis of Black Masculinity in Racial Capitalism. Jordana is at um, the School of International uh, Service at American University. And um, this is her first book um if i may say so a baby because she actually has another baby <laughs> at home recently that i hope is is going to prosper as this book i know is going to prosper so i think without further ado i'm going to turn it over to jordana to say a few words about the project uh introduce it um say whatever she would like to say i always think that jumping straight to commentating is kind of harsh because uh we want to have a dialogue and uh, we can't anticipate that everyone coming to the session will have read the book and i think it's uh the author's prerogative to just set the stage so i hope i've um you know built those stairs now for jordana to step on and um please go ahead Thank you so much, uh, Nina and the, the CIS organizers, and um, special thanks also to Isabel and Sasha and Jason for coming. For those of you here in the evening, um, and for those of you who are, are taking the effort to, to subject yourself to more screen time, um, thank you so much. So um, yes, and, and I, I couldn't be there in person, um, I do have a newborn, but but I loved those words about hoping that they both prosper. So that is something I will I will I will keep in mind um, for for many years to come. What I'd like to do now is actually start by just reading two excerpts. Uh, the introduction, just the first few pages of the introduction, that I think um, does kind of set up um, what I'm trying to do. And then just a little paragraph um, from later in the introduction where I talk about my, my methodological approach um, to the book. And after that, I mean, I could say more, but I think I'll just leave it to, to the conversation after that. So the introduction is called Greatness in Each Man. Pont General de Gaulle is a bridge that connects Plateau Abidjan Center and proud bastion of wide leafy boulevards and still in concrete modernity with Trècheville, the city's original African district or quartier populaire, following the segregated spatial logic of the colonial city. Trècheville is named after Marcel Trèche-la-Plaine, early French explorer and first colonial administrator of Côte d'Ivoire. Like Trècheville, scattered throughout Abidjan are roads, bridges, and neighborhoods that preserve the appellations of the colonial era. Unlike those post-colonial states that indigenized that, the naming of their quotidian urban spaces, in Abidjan, durable affirmations of European influence and the decades of France Afrique that dominate political, economic, and cultural relations between ex-colony and metropole endure. Pont General de Gaulle honors the president of France when Côte d'Ivoire gained its independence. Throughout his political life, Charles de Gaulle esteemed the first president, um, Ivoirian president, Philippe houphouët boigny as his close confidant. Côte d'Ivoire, the coast of ivory, alludes to a resource of brilliant whiteness whose violent extraction of bone from flesh is now firmly coupled with the dark side of the global economy. Yet, Côte d'Ivoire's most forceful assertion with respect to its name has involved not this association, but rather the maintenance of an unyielding Frenchness, 
It declared in 1986 a refusal to recognize any translations of its name, the English Ivory Coast, the Spanish Costa de Marfil, informal diplomatic exchanges. After reaching land in Pracheville, Pont General de Gaulle arrives at the Jardin Bourse de Travail, translated roughly as the labor exchange or labor placement garden. The bridge terminates in a roundabout adjacent to the Solibra beer and soft drink uh, factory, a prominent manufacturing and distribution company with a near monopoly over the Ivoirian beverage market. Crossing this bridge in 2008, one would have looked up to find a billboard advertising Guinness, an Irish beer locally bottled and distributed by Solibra. Eight black men stand on either side of a man-sized Guinness bottle. The label reads in English, foreign extra. Each proud and distinguished looking, the men from left to right appear to be first, a retiree invi invoking a lifetime of steady work and a pension and old age, followed by men whose sartorial expression suggests various accumulation strategies, a businessman, an athlete, a mechanic, a man whose casual t-shirt and jeans indicate no discernible trade, a pilot, a doctor, and a DJ. The man in jeans holds a banner declaring, il y a de la greatness en chaque homme. There is greatness in each man. Unlike the obdurate francophonie of the name Côte d'Ivoire, here the roots of greatness bow to an anglophone foreignness. That the average man whose work is unmarked bears the banner for all men, illustrates how Guinness has tapped into an African predicament of jobless men. A validation, this advertisement lays claim to parity among men irrespective of work, when otherwise empty time, waiting time, is made full with consumer time, momentary fixes of meaning making. A man's worth then is then contingent on something else, in this case, a Guinness beer. The Guinness brand bestows this resignified worth. This branding feeds a familiar, a familiar narrative of branded black bodies in the capitalist economy. In 2008, Cote d'Ivoire was in the sixth year of a civil war that had split it into a rebel held north and government controlled south. Already in its third decade of precipitous economic decline, the war exacerbated la crise, the crisis, justified the grounded economy, scared away much of the French and other expatriate populations who had long monopolized the inchoate business sector, and swelled an already strained urban labor market with displaced persons from the hinterland. Once the Paris of West Africa, Abidjan had become a decadent city. Decadent in the double sense of the excessive indulgence in the state uh, lavished on the city center during its heyday and in the dilapidated condition of the majority of its urban space, constituted not by the planned city, uh, the planned colonial city, but by the quartier populaire. This was a time when, by official counts, three quarters of Abidjan's four million residents were self employed informally, earning their keep through luck and a hustler sensibility. To find work in a factory like Solibra was inconceivable for the average man with poor social networks. Job seekers greatly outnumbered jobs, and the broker who connected them invariably demanded a hefty finder's fee. Once hired, a worker's earnings were subject to a regular cut from the manager. With so many desperate for these coveted positions, after two or three months, Solibra was at liberty to fire one and hire another itinerant worker thwarting the emergence of permanent employees who might then be entitled to full wages and benefits. Or so recounted the vendor ambulant, mobile street vendors who sold along the stretch of road. Concentrated with no shortage of irony around the Jardin Bourse de Travail at an intersection duly nicknamed Solibra, these vendors sold inflatable balls, car mats, clam quarters, toilet paper, phone, re phone recharge cards, and other assorted bric-a-brac to motorists stalled in rush hour traffic. Just above them, as if to garner some dignity out of their uncertain status, stood that Guinness billboard. It offered an alternative possibility, an imaginary that reflected the shifting occupational realities and aspirations of Abidjanese men during a time when finding a steady job was as unlikely as striking media stardom. In this imaginary established professionals rub shoulders with the new figures of the crisis economy. Equivalent then are the pilot and the DJ, the athlete and the mechanic, the businessman and the street vendor.
What they have in common, what makes them all great here is a Guinness in that, their hands. Guinness here it explicitly invokes greatness outside of wage labor, a realm demarcated by the colonial project. This greatness was also rooted in conquest. The imperial mission sought out foreign possessions not only as a source of land and labor, but also as a market for European products. Undergirding this mission was a civilizational narrative that portrayed the consumption of foreign goods as Africans path up the gilded evolutionary staircase. In late capitalism, a time when the reality of permanent contraction surpasses the anticipatory moment of an expanding wage economy, incorporation of the world's bottom billion renders proof of its triumph. An entrepreneurial by necessity, petty consumer class emerges as capitalism's final frontier. Supplanting the promise of wage labor under a regulated planned economy, every man is now free to achieve greatness, making and spending on his own accord. His capacity to do so is a test of his self-worth. For those Trashville men who worked underneath this billboard, earning a few dollars on a good day, to be branded by Guinness was to gain status. In the absence of more durable lifestyle indicators, local hierarchies ranked who drinks a Guinness, who drinks a local beer, and who drinks at all. The Guinness advertisement extolled a vision of corporate empire and citizen consumer, yet residuals of other imperial etchings coexisted in the space. Pont General de Gaulle, the Cartier Presville, the name Côte d'Ivoire, all marked Abidjan as a bulwark of France Afrique, solidified through the extractive and exploitative relations of metropole to colony. These etchings overlaid different eras in the continuous story of racial capitalism, eras that differentially incorporated Black men into processes of production, consumption, and commodification. The story of Abidjan is a story of racial capitalism told in the exaggerated hierarchies of work and in the racialized imaginaries that these hierarchies produced as men sought survival and status. During the interregnum, the miracle turned mirage that became known as la crise, imaginaries circulated in lieu of probable expectations. These imaginaries bore the legacies of Black men's incorporation into racial capitalism as would-be workers and would-be consumers in a modern economy and in an enduring relationship to commodification as value. All right, so those were just the first few pages and then I'm just gonna read one paragraph on the methods uh, for, for the book, the logic of the book. So it's under a section called A Note on the Narrative and Rethinking the Ethnographic Object. The theoretical work that this text performs began with my fieldwork in Abidjan, with encounters that will doubtlessly be familiar to students of post-coloniality and popular culture in African cities. I take a lengthy detour to arrive at that point, however, on a course that interrogates Abidjanese men's subject subjectivities not in themselves, but rather as they are informed in dialect dialectical tension by and through existing relations of power. These subjectivities recall the direct Franco-Ivoirian colonial lineage, as well as an invoke distant Black Atlantic imaginaries whose own respective struggles I am compelled to reconstruct to make sense of present contradictions. I historicize the subject formation of underemployed Abidjanese men as a means to theorize more broadly the co-constitution of Black masculinity's economic and social value in racial capitalism. To do so requires telling a story that is equal parts theory and history before finally arriving at, or rather returning to, ethnography. In that sense, my narrative proceeds in reverse order from my scholarly journey, an inductive methodology refashioned into a deductive analysis. All right. So awesome. Thank you very much. And, uh, I guess, are the people in the background going to show me back on the screen or should I be moving somewhere else? Well, you all can hear me probably. Um, so then without further ado, I'm going to ask Isabel Pike, who is at the 
Institute, is it Institute oh, for yes. Development? Very long name. Very Graduate long name. Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva. In Geneva, but I think you're getting a new colleague, Kristen McNeil. Kristen McNeil, yes. And Annarika Kalkanen, who's also a SASI person. Oh, very so, good. Uh, yeah. So lots of connections, but I'm especially pleased to uh, meet you at, on this occasion. And yeah. thank you very much for agreeing to provide some comments. Definitely. I think you also have somebody who is prospering in your own yes. family. Yes, Jordana and I almost have twins, actually. Uh, yeah, I also have a three-month-old. Um, yeah, so first of all, um, you know, really thanks to Jordana for inviting me to read and discuss this book uh, with Jason and Sasha. Um, it was really such a pleasure to, to read the book. Um, it's a sweeping, thought-provoking read. Uh, that's sure to become a classic of global sociology, urban studies, sociology of gender and masculinity, and many other subfields, I'm sure. So really, it's an honor to be here, and thank you. Uh, so I thought I would structure uh, my comments around three main ways in which the book shifted my thinking. Um, there's many more that I could list here, um, but I'll focus on these three. And then I'll conclude with a few question type comments. Um, so first, I found the book very helpful in thinking through the term, uh, the use of the term crisis in research and theory on masculinity. So in my own work, which uh, mostly focuses on Kenya and the discourse in Kenya that the boy child has been forgotten, so this narrative that boys and men have been forgotten, um, I've had some uncertainties about how to use this term crisis. So it almost feels that it requires quotation marks in, on, in order to create a distance um, from discourse that positions men as victims uncritically. Um, but this book really shows how the crisis of masculinity is the product of multiple other crises. So Jordana writes, racial capitalism and the political economy of patriarchy collapse the crisis of work into a crisis of masculinity. And this term crisis also comes up in the book um, or this sort of connection between the economic and uh, masculinity comes up uh, with the fact that Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire experienced la crise in the 80s and 90s. So we have this sort of uh, yeah, double use of the term crisis in the book. Um, so rather than just uh, discuss how the orators and vendors, who are the main case studies um, in, in the book, in Abidjan, fail to live up to social expectations of masculinity, Jordana really drills into the origins of those social expectations, mm -hmm. showing how the breadwinner ideal was produced in Abidjan how French colonial rule made earning a salary central to respected masculinity or evolué identity. So in this sense, she really politicizes the idea of the crisis of masculinity, both in a sort of small P and big P sense. So she shows how racial capitalism shapes how young men experience the urban landscape of Abidjan and how they understand their uh, own circumstances. But then also, for example, how Ivorian presidents and other politicians fit into these different imaginaries of racialized masculinity. And of course, the book's story is bigger than Abidjan. It's actually really global in scope, showing how uh, Black masculinity the world over is associated with crisis. So the second point here actually connects to um, Jordana's reading of her methodology section. So something that really struck me with this book is how it sets up its argument. So as you read the book, you almost feel its argument viscerally due to its structure. So rather than begin with ethnographic material, as is commonly done, the book ends up there, as Jordana says, after a lengthy detour of theory and history. So before reading about the fascinating cases of the orators and the vendors, um, you first read about the racialized logics driving the capitalist projects of slavery and colonialism. So you read about French abolitionists, the Black Panthers, Air Jordans, colonial postcards, advertisements for soap, amongst many other things before arriving at the ethnographic material. 
So as a result, by the time the reader gets to that uh, empirical uh, research, they're better prepared to appreciate and understand, for example, why the orators admire the business of Anglophone Ghana, or why poor vendors spend a disproportionate amount of their money on their clothes. And while Jordana, of course, uh, provides rich analysis in the ethnographic chapters, the foundation is really so carefully laid that the reader is already making these connections uh, for themselves once they arrive. Um, and the ethnographic uh, material is, is really very uh, moving and, uh, and vivid. As Jordana writes at the end of the book, um, deprivation will compel ingenuity and tribulation will inspire beauty. But at the same time, there's really no romanticization or shying away from complexity here. So this comes through, I think, particularly, the sort of complexity comes through particularly strongly in the case of the orators, um, who, yeah, Jordana has this amazing field site, which then you're shocked later, spoiler, uh, to find out in the book that this, uh, her field sites were, um, were raised to the ground um, some years later. Um, so these are raters who sort of pontificate on politics in a kind of amphitheater style. So these are raters um, critique France's colonial legacy and present day imperial forces. Um, but at the same time, they shore up their masculine identity through anti-immigrant and misogynistic language. Um, the book also addresses complexity during fieldwork um, in a really uh, striking uh, uh, discussion of positionality, and that's actually how the book ends. Um, and I always find it really uh, very refreshing when scholars are truly candid about the complexity, the sort of human complexity um, that's almost inevitable when doing qualitative work. Um, so Jordana describes, for example, here, how she was actually the butt of misogynistic jokes during one particular orator's speeches, or how, for example, the vendors um, probably did not consider her as a romantic partner because she paid for their drinks, <laughs> or how she was seen as black in some moments and white in others. And rather than shying away for the, from these moments of complexity, um, Jordana describes how being attuned to them um, rather than sort of sh uh, shuddering away from them, um, actually informed her argument and sort of led her to, to her argument. Um, so yeah, both how the way the book is structured and then how um, Jordana reflects on her method, I think is really um, something uh, very striking about, about the book and also inspiring, I think, for others. So lastly, um, as I was reading this book, um, I was thinking about how it con contributes to the discussion on how grievances and claims around citizen citizenship and rights are articulated. And maybe this has to do um, with my own work, which is thinking about how this uh, narrative about the boy child in Kenya is also some sort of an entanglement of grievances. Um, but in particular, I was thinking about this book in conversation with another brilliant new book um, by gender and political theorist um, Sumi Madok um, of LSC, um, and this book is titled Vernacular Rights Cultures. Um, and through the concept of hak, uh, Sumi Madok, uh, which is the term for rights used in much of the Middle East and South Asia, Madok um, sort of uses this term as a lens um, and moves away from the Eurocentric origin story of human rights. So we see something similar actually in a, ma a man amongst other men. Um, so Jordana is looking for these concepts that are employed and deployed in, um, in her sites, such as how black, um, the English term is used or evolué is used um, to make bigger claims about rights. Um, but I think uh, something that Jordana also does here, which is maybe unusual or pushes this conversation about um, uh, language and discourse about citizenship and rights, is that she pushes us to look further than just speech and language. Um, and so the book really shows how arguments about rights manifest in art, for example, the Quran 
uh, statues that are on the front of the book um, and barbershop signs. There's a whole sort of visual anthropology chapter to the book. Um, and also um, a lot of discussion of music, music lyrics and film as well. So um, yeah, sort of pushing us to think uh, to different arenas of um, rights and citizenship claims. So now just um, I'll conclude with um, some sort of short question uh, type comments. Um, and mostly these are about how racial capitalism interacts with other systems and institutions. Um, so first, um, because really there's an important moral component to this story, um, you know, it's really about in a way how these men um, sort of define their self-worth, how others see them as worthy or unworthy. Um, I was curious to hear about how, if at all, religion fit into this story. So did the vendors and orators rely on, rely on or reject religion as a source of agency? Um, you know, did the orators see uh, religion as another imperialist force or maybe something that could aid business? Um, and the book shows really how racial capitalism positions black men as would-be consumers, would-be entrepreneurs. Um, so I was wondering if bringing in religion complicated these categories or perhaps adds other ones. So for, in my own research in Kenya, I saw that for some men of little means, religion allowed them to act, enact another type of masculine agency, one of restraint uh, around alcohol, for example, and allowed them to enact an elder status and move beyond this category of youth, which Jordana also talks a lot about in her book, even if they did not have much money. Mm -hmm. um, so then two other sort of uh, systems and institutions I was interested in uh, um, hearing about whether they connected or interacted with racial capitalism um, in your field work was um, non-Western traditions. So the book is very powerful in showing these global connections, but what about uh, beliefs and traditions that are specific not only to, to Cote d'Ivoire maybe, but uh, um, even specific ethnic groups within Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so for example, in my own work, I've seen how circumcision, which often takes place um, in the teenage years uh, in the part of the country I was working in, was um, imbued with new meaning because of this crisis of masculinity uh, sentiment uh, that was that's taking place there as well. Um, and then I was also interested in how international development uh, interacts with racial capitalism here to create certain types of masculine imaginaries, like international development often positions women as useful, full of potential, and um, then sort of we have this foil of the useless man or something like that that emerges. So I was wondering if that was also coming up in Cote d'Ivoire because I think it, it does come up in other contexts. Um, and lastly, two very small points not totally connected to those others is that the orators make really a big distinction between Francophone and Anglophone settings, putting Ghana, for example, and its business environment on a pedestal. Um, and so I was wondering about this distinction and whether the, I was just reflecting myself on whether the literature on masculinity in sub-Saharan Africa shows big differences between Anglophone and Francophone settings, or whether what we see is more commonalities. So um, you know, what's sort of um, different about Francophone settings for masculinity and racialized masculinity <coughs> as opposed to Anglophone settings. Um, and then one last thought is that this book is really a story of the city very much focused on um, the city of Abidjan. And so I'd be curious to hear any thoughts at all on how racial capitalism uh, plays out, uh, shapes masculinity in uh, rural Cote d'Ivoire or rural settings uh, more generally. Um, so thank you so much again uh, for inviting me to participate in this book salon. Um, it's a fabulous book, it was a pleasure to read and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, I think without further ado, Jordana probably wants to say something, but she will hold her breath until other comments uh, are presented. I would like to turn it to Alexandra Sasha White, who is also joining us uh, on Zoom and uh, has his comments prepared. He is at the Johns Hopkins University 
in Baltimore and a sociologist, right? Although links to medical school as well. You are welcome to say a few words about your yeah. background too. <laughs> All right, th thank you so much. I'm, I'm currently at Johns Hopkins and apparently I have unstable internet despite being at this prestigious research university. So I apologize if um, I come in and out, please let me know, I can always, we'll, we'll figure it out. But, um, and I also want to apologize for not being there in person. We had um, some COVID issues in the family. So um, I, I, I'm not obviously in Amsterdam. Um, so I want to start by saying how appreciative I am to have been asked to serve on this panel. I really had a wonderful time reading this book. And I think that this book both provides a deeply necessary set of interventions into the sociology of political economy, racial capitalism, as well as ethnographic practice. And it's already on my syllabus for the next time I teach my class on racial capitalism. Um, it's, it's in there. So um, this, this book is one that requires careful attention as the argument and interpretation is grounded so heavily and effectively, both in ethnographic evidence as well as the multifaceted and layered histories and moments that Matten lays out so clearly um, and effectively in this work. So I kind of want to speak primarily in my comments about really the intersections of theory and method where I feel the book really uh, strikes me as making some very uh, important contributions. Um, namely the methodological approaches this work takes and the literatures in which it's situ situated in order to facilitate the analyses and interpretations in the work. Um, this is not me seeing myself as some sort of authorizing figure or force in any way, but rather as someone who, um, you know, as a reader gained much from reading this and is keen to think about how I might situate this work within wider fields and think about the, the purchases that it's really had to my, to my thinking. Um, and what I find most striking about this work is that it provides such a rich pan-Atlantic and historically located analysis of black masculinity and racial capitalism in Abidjan and the methods and approaches um, to writing involved in this book. There have been so many analyses of life under capitalism, colonial control, and post-colonial existence in Francophone Africa from um, Amy Césaire and Suzanne Césaire's writings on negritude, surrealism, and colonialism, to Frantz Fanon, to Albert Memmi, and Pierre Bourdieu, to name a few. There's both a rich history and a rich literature on the crises of empire, capitalism, race, and blackness in particular. At the same time, our sociological um, analytics, especially drawn from mid-century thinkers, would suggest colonialism, especially late 19th and 20th century French empire, provoked and produced crises of alienation and hysteresis for those unfit or unaccustomed to capitalist relations introduced to Africa by colonial forces. Seen especially through the lens of development narratives, these crises of the inability to negotiate pastoral and non-capitalist political economies and capitalist ones produces a rupture that erases and negates the black colonial subject. While many mid 20th century ethnographers and early 20th century eugenicists and statisticians like Frederick Hoffman and their prog progeny, uh, especially in the US like Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the United States found this to be the case, one could argue as well that the Chicago School of Sociology similarly claimed these conclusions though for largely more eradicationist ends. So what I find so remarkable in Matlin's work is that in writing a deep and complex analysis of racial capitalism and black masculinity from ethnographic data, she does not ground her analysis purely on her present experiences and her rich ethnographic field work. Rather, she implots these experiences and data within a much larger and much longer transatlantic history, producing a remarkable black Atlantic ethnomethodology. In her analysis of racial capitalism and its contours, Matlin doesn't locate its form with any particular place and time, but rather in shifting Atlantic systems of relations. Drawing on less usual and very welcome sources um, for her formation of racial capitalism, like Bell Hooks, Stuart Hall, Robbie Shilliam, and Paul Gilroy, she articulates a history of racial capitalism rooted in both, both in histories of slavery, colonial extraction, colonization, and post-colonial relations, within a capitalist economic world system, but also a history of the aqueous and non-aqueous terrains upon which black diasporic traditions have formed, unformed and are transmogrified through against and perpendicular to the shifting systems of relation under racial capitalism. What this provides in its simplest form are sets of vocabularies for understanding better 
more completely and importantly, with more complexity, the lives and experiences, challenges and opportunities of the informants in the research. Rather than post-colonial flummoxed subjects torn between economic systems, Matlin, through historiographies of the Black Atlantic, locates the informants in the study as people who have long complicated relations to capitalism that date back before most theorists of capital considered it even to have existed. To borrow from Angela Davis, uh, just as the enslaved were the first theorists of their condition, so too were Africans and especially West Africans and their diasporic descendants, some of the first to understand relations of capital from the position of commodity, laborer, consumer, and the position of the commoditized. Mallon's rich historical chapters, far from merely cataloging a linear history of racial capitalism as it relates to Abigene experiences of Black masculinity, explores this history as an accumulated assemblage of racial capitalist relations that are at once local as well as globally con constituted. Um, in chapter four, for instance, Matlin demonstrates how circuits of negation uh, in the capitalist system operate across systems that have profited from marketing Black people as objects for commercial consumption across the Atlantic world and beyond, and how images of Black inhumanity are trafficked for profit in similar and divergent ways. Likewise, instead of opting for a comparative approach exploring crises of Black masculinities under racial capitalism in Abidjan and another site, for instance, we're seeking to generalize the experience in Abidjan to the world. Matlin does something quite exciting in this text, which is to have us rethink racial capitalism, not only as a globally, or excuse me, as a historically constituted global phenomenon, but also to consider racial capitalism, especially as it relates to anti-Blackness, not solely as concept, but also as operating within its own geographies. In this, I took Abidjan and the Abidjané that Madeleine worked with, not as a case from which to explore racial capitalism, but Abidjan as a particular nodal point in the geography of racial capitalism from which we can see its wider operation. In this, Madeleine does tremendous work highlighting how Blackness and gender, especially masculinity, are not solely tied up with colonial or Western visions of breadwinning, but also, and as importantly, linked to the ability to consume elements of the, from the global capitalist system and commodity chain. In place of steady income or stable economic relations, the ability to purchase certain products and perform certain forms of consumption becomes shibboleths for acceptable Black masculinity in the modern world. This consumptive practice, which often admires and covers performances of Black capitalist consumption in the United States, simultaneously sees diasporic community and seeks recognition through consumer practice, while that same consumer practice might erase or ignore the violences and veiled racial oppressions that lie just beneath the surface of corporate Nike advertisements that commodify Black American life and culture for profit. At the same time, the location of racial capitalism as both a historical force and a geographically located and mutable one recognizes that the stakes and demands of living as a Black person and as a Black man in a racial capitalist system has required at various times and moments and continues to in some way, either the erasure of an existence that rejects racial capitalist relations and ways of being that seek to replicate a state of not quite right whiteness or one that quite literally leads to a state of bare life in a necropolitical sense. Those who struggle to live within or outside of racial capitalist relations are always conf confronted with the imminent with, excuse me, with their imminent disposability. Capitalism thus becomes in a very real way, a mode to survival, even as it commodifies, demands commodification and consumption. I think Matlin herself sums this up brilliantly on page 92 in the lyrics to a song uh, she writes with her respondents. And I apologize, I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna to wrap this because that would be far too cringy, but I'm, I'm gonna quote it. Um, with, with, with one hand, he's trying to make it, but the other has got to take it. It's a rat race that he's playing, gives all he got so he can stay in, but he's barely even hanging. That's the reason why he's singing. He don't want to be, and then later on, um, he don't want to be no thief. He don't want to be no pirate. He just want to make his music and he wants you all to buy it. At the same time, of course, we cannot leave out, um, ignore, or even think for a moment without the central argument of the text. Think about racial capitalism, 
requires us to think about gender, racism, and capitalism. Yeah. Matlin paints a vivid historical and contemporary picture of human belonging in a capitalist system only existing for those who can, can consume and provide for their heterosexual family unit. To exist outside is to be less than human and less than a man. At the same time, the ability to consume is a precondition for sexual conquest, for economic uplift, for global legibility, and possibly for the provision of, for one's family. So I wanna just close um, really with um, my thanks for this brilliant book that's gonna be so useful to my students and I think is really radically important for the field of sociology to kind of link um, what at the moment I think is a nascent um, analysis of racial capitalism um, to much longer and much uh, and, 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 and important um, legacies of um, cultural studies of the work of the Birmingham School, of the work of Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, and others in thinking about the Black Atlantic as a, um, as a, as a fluid space through which these relations shift and transform and from which we can't think outside of in so many ways or have to consider in a variety of ways. So um, rather than provide critiques on a work that's already published and, and done and will provide so much great value, I have a few questions, um, which is really, you know, what does um, a man among other men hold for our understandings of the histories of racial capitalism? Um, how might we be called to rewrite these understandings as a result? And I'd also love to know more from Jordana, how she sees her work providing a necessary challenge to the work on racial capitalism that refuses or simply ignores the gender dynamics of, of racial capitalism. So thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure to be here. I hope you heard all that and, uh, and, and I look forward to everything in the comments. Thank you so very much, Sasha. We did hear it. It was another awesome set of comments. Um, wonderful, really. So we'll move right ahead to hear from Jason um, Jackson who is at MIT, and he's had a full day, I know. <laughs> so however you want to proceed, shorter comments, uh, longer comments, you were also on the panel for Alice Amston. We couldn't control the schedule, but I know it's been late in the night. We definitely look forward to hearing your, your feedback. Um, so thank you, Nina, very much for the nice introduction. and. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to um, be here um, to have a chance to, to talk about um, Jordana's book. Um, hi, nice to see you on Zoom, Sasha. <laughs> great to see you as well. Um, so there are many things that I really, really love um, about this book. Um, and so I'm going to probably uh, what I think I'll do is um, I'll say um, I'll just speak for a couple of minutes with some sort of overarching sort of reflections um, on the book. Um, and then I have, I think, maybe four things that I want to um, uh, ask Jordana about, which maybe will prompt um, some of our conversations afterwards. <clears throat> okay, so there are many things I really love about this book. Um, so it locates um, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, in particular, Abidjan, and within the broader economic roller coaster, um, which I'm thinking about now, sort of beyond uh, just the, the Cote d'Ivoirean case, <clears throat> within the broader economic roller coaster. Um, of post-independence excitement. Um, so, so sort of the moment um, when anti-colonial actors were able to um, sort of seize control um, of their nascent um, states, um, which was followed, um, of course, in many contexts, um, such as in Cote d'Ivoire, um, by conflict and civil war, um, and then led us into this moment um, of contemporary uh, neoliberal um, malaise. It also locates um, uh, these dynamics, um, which are global. So we see these, unfortunately, of course, reflected in many, many other um, post-colonial um, contexts. And also we can think about them in some imperial, sort of in the imperial um, context of the United States, um, which Jonas book allows us to do. Um, but it also locates this story, this kind of roller coaster um, within a global racial hierarchy and sort of glo global racial structure. Um, that on one hand is generally, um, uh, um, uh, sort of conceptualized um, within the context of a white black binary um, of global north and global south. But one of the things which is really fabulous um, about this book is the way in which it also allows us to think about differences um, within these sort of like broad sort of messy categories of, of race, and particularly through what Jordana refers to as tropes of blackness. 
And really think this brings in um, a fresh analytic um, of race, um, as well as new actors. Um, and I think the sort of combination of having the orators um, and uh, vendors as sort of the key actors within the story um, really brings a richness to this literature alongside many of the sort of usual types of um, uh, actors that we have. So workers in factories, for example, or agrarian workers and so forth. Um, so that's one of the things that I really um, appreciated um, about this book. Um, uh, conceptually, I also really love, and um, both um, Sasha and Isabel have noted this, um, uh, the way in which it's centered um, in an analysis of racial capitalism. So I'll say this a little bit here and maybe come back to it at the, the end. Um, but much of the literature, because I think it speaks of this question where Sasha uh, sort of ended, um, much of the literature on, on racial capitalism, um, on one hand, certainly is deeply historical in thinking about how um, capitalism has been fundamentally um, constructed um, around um, race um, and how race itself has been used to construct uh, modern capitalism. Um, but again, much of this has been through participation in the global um, economy, by which I mean the production of goods and services um, that feed into global trade. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's really nice in this book is the way in which both um, is very global um, in thinking about, for example, these tropes of blackness, um, on one hand, but then also very much centered um, in the case of Abidjan uh, in thinking about how these manifest within a kind of local, urban, and broader sort of like national um, context. Um, so I think that's really fabulous. Okay. Um, so for the last couple of years, um, I've had the real pleasure of teaching Jordana's um, ASR article, which preceded um, this book um, in my institution's um, of modern capitalism um, course. Um, which has been really great um, and I pair it alongside um, in the syllabus alongside um, or I think following on um, uh, Kim Huang's um, book Dealing with Desire uh -huh. um, and there's so many kind of nice parallels I think um, between both these work and works and I know Huang's um, a book is cited um, in that article um, in certainly the ethnographic approach which is taken on one hand um, a sort of very innovative um, comparative um, analysis um, that we see uh, in both um, and then finally, the way in which they're both very much cited in urban contexts, uh, but nevertheless um, are really speaking to um, broader issues within global um, capitalism. Okay, so let me turn to um, three things that I wanted uh, to ask um, uh, Jordan maybe for the, the conversation. Um, so the first is um, a sort of really interesting juxtaposition um, that I see in um, the book. Um, uh, when we think about um, uh, questions of the extent to which how uh, some of the actors within the books, the orators and the um, and the vendors, um, how they understand sort of ideas of blackness, ideas of economic success, um, not just within the um, their own context in Cote d'Ivoire, um, but also globally. Um, and here, one sort of group of um, people that I kind of thought about and wondered about were the diaspora. Um, and the reason is I was wondering about what kinds of connections um, do um, these actors have with other representatives of, sort of global capitalism. Um, so, for example, on one hand, we might think about how um, sets of actors um, are deeply embedded in the global economy. These actors rather are deeply embedded in the global economy. Um, they recognize these different paths uh, to success. Um, in particular, in the book, um, uh, for instance, um, the, the sort of it's not so a model or a kind of hegemonic representation, I guess, I think is a term that, that Jordana uses um, of Black Americans um, as a model, um, especially athletes and rappers and so forth. Um, so, on one hand, that's one uh, sort of model, um, or one sort of uh, the source of one kind of imaginary um, that um, uh, the actors, the orators, and, and the um, vendors in particular um, have of um, what success might look like um, as a black person um, or a black man um, in the global economy. But on the other hand, um, at various times, I sort of wondered um, about the extent to which they seemed a bit cut off um, from uh, the rest of the from the global economy. Um, in that um, their ideas um, about what would constitute um, a black man's success um, were shaped by these sort of distant um, sorts of, of figures, as opposed to, for example, perhaps um, relatives, cousins um, who, you know, maybe live in the diaspora, particularly maybe in France or other parts of Europe, maybe in the United States, Canada, some of the usual places um, where we find um, diasporas um, represented. 
And so I was curious about other kinds of, of models, other sources of these kind of imaginaries um, uh, that might animate some of the ways in which um, uh, Jonani, your actor, sort of thought about different paths um, to success. Um, and here I should say that um, <laughs> this is always a, a slightly unfair thing, but whenever you read these books, you obviously always sort of think about personal experience as well. And so I'm from Jamaica, and it was really easy for me to sort of think about this story um, in the Jamaican context. Um, and so this is, I think, where part of this question is, is coming from, um, just because the diaspora looms so large um, in, in Jamaica and in other parts of the Caribbean. Um, and so I was curious about how and to what extent um, you saw, whether it be the diaspora or other ways in which um, these actors um, have uh, different sources of different kinds of imaginaries um, of, of Black masculinity um, uh, in other parts of the world, coming from other parts of the world. Okay, um, so the second thing has to do with, um, uh, the second sort of uh, question, I suppose, um, has to do with positionality. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting um, that I think I noted um, in the book is that there seems to be a, a contrast um, to some extent between the kinds of relationship uh, relationships that you're able to develop with the vendors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, you know, participating in something where like, you know, making music, for instance, and the things you talk about in the book, um, dancing with them on stage during shows and so forth. Um, and some of this is kind of gets into more detail um, in your really great um, postscript um, that Isabel uh, noted um, that we talked about this morning, uh, when you talk about, you know, sort of relationships and some of the complexities um, with people like Tino and, and MC Black. So on one hand, there seemed to be um, a description of these kind of close relationships, um, which you know, many of us may be familiar with that you know, we always develop when we do these kinds of um, ethnographic uh, work. On the other hand, I was wondering if it, to, it sort of seemed to potentially contrast uh, with maybe a more distant, a more measured, uh, maybe even more tense um, relationship um, with the orators. And, that was interesting. Now, there, in the book, um, because of some of the um, ways in which um, uh, some of the kinds of scripts that the orators uh, would use, especially to the extent that they were um, not only gendered um, but sexualized, as you talk about, one might, under, might, might see some of the reasons why that might be the case there. Um, but nevertheless, one thing that I thought about was that I could imagine that in some ways your positionality, um, uh, not so much as a, a woman, um, but as a PhD student, so as someone who is highly, who might be seen as highly educated, um, as very much tapped into or being able to um, uh, engage in discourses around politics, around economics, in the ways that I imagine the orators saw themselves being able to do, um, that they might, um, there might be one sort of plane along which um, you might have um, engaged with them. Um, whereas that might not be the case, I would imagine, um, with the vendors, if for no other reason, just because of the differences in sort of education um, and so forth. So I was kind of curious about the, what seems to be this, um, uh, this sort of differences um, in these kinds of relationships um, with your two um, sets of, of actors. Um, and Finally, a very quick question about, uh, you know, inevitable question about power and agency, I guess. Um, and small so, question. sorry, <laughs> so, That's yeah, small exactly. question. can you solve the problems of structure and agency for us? Um, and so I sort of really curious about ways in, so we see, we of course get much in, in your story, um, a really strong idea about the ways in which um, these actors are constrained by their sort of structural positions, broadly defined politically, economically, um, et cetera. Um, but we also see ways in the book um, that both sets of actors um, deploy very creative and innovative strategies um, as means of survival, um, certainly on, on one hand, but also potentially, and this is always the sort of goal um, for both sets of actors, um, as I read it, um, a social advancement, um, especially the sort of long-term goal ultimately um, of getting married. And so I was curious if you could tell us a little bit more about um, any ways that you might see that these actors were able to not only challenge, but even perhaps in some cases sort of invert um, what might otherwise be seen as their structural subordination um, in ways that would allow them to um, maybe even have the possibility um, of creating new narratives um, of success beyond some of the ones that are sort of imported um, through the media, etc., um, from other parts of the world. 
So I'll stop there. Um, I'll just say um, big, big thanks again um, for us being able to participate in this um, salon. Um, and also thank you for writing the book. Thank you for writing the article. It's generated many interesting conversations in my class over the last couple of years. And now I have the book to replace it with and add it to on the syllabus. I'm looking forward to that as well. That is awesome. Thank you. One applause for also Jason's comments. Jordana? Uh, it is on you to pick uh, what you would like to um, engage with. It definitely won't be all, but I hope this conversation will also continue uh, beyond this occasion. It is so generative, we already see, and uh, it, you know, really fabulous discussion. I hope also for those who haven't had a chance to read the book as a teaser. So um, the floor is back to you. Um, the microphone, I guess, uh, invite you to to share some of the comments to everyone's comments. So thank you so much. Um, it's it's the kind of thing that you know having this this wonderful feedback makes me want to just have kept on writing the book forever and just kept having conversations. Um, I'm, I'm happy it's finished. I'm happy it's out. And I guess this is the next stage, right? Um, so so I certainly do hope that that this is the beginning of conversations with Jason, with Sasha, and Isabel, um, for one, and, and certainly beyond. Um, but these are all wonderful, wonderful comments. And I think I'll start um, just with what's fresh and then move backwards um, since since Jason was the, the last person who spoke. Um, so um, yeah, so, so the structure and agency, I mean, this is, and it's actually something that I think Sasha was talking about um, in his comments, but absolutely um, what you saw was a desire to go beyond survival and to, to advance oneself, but what I'm arguing the and what we're capturing with with hegemony and and the role of masculinity as it interacts with um, with racial capitalism is that doing so is within right if you if you try to work outside of those structures that's where the erasure comes the the illegibility right um, so you in, if you want to be a man within these systems you're hooking on to to systems that might advance masculinity, but on a whole structurally, we have seen how they've operated to devalue blackness, even with those tropes of individual black men achieving um, greatness, right? Maybe through Nike or through, right? These kinds of sponsorships that then we see the factories and we see, we see other um, racial capitalism being enacted. So, so I would certainly, so was that inverting structural subordination? No, right? And so this is where I'm talking about consent and, and hegemony and, and, how, and I would say that the, the narratives of success, they are new narratives, right? They're the narratives of the entrepreneur and the consumer, which I argue with the more, the larger historical scope that that's actually always been the way that black men have been able to be um, by and large successful because of the, um, the, the being shut out of these traditional bread uh, winning opportunities of wage labor that traditionally, you know, it's been through having these kinds of, you know, successes out, outside of that framework. And is now I argue preempting in this kind of global neoliberal economy, this, this and this moment of the post wage moment that actually blackness preempts that. Um, so, and and are there ways to, to think outside of it? Absolutely, but but they're outside of, I mean, thinking about, and this would go to, to Isabel's question that I'll, I'll get to later, but outside of, you know, capitalist associations of masculinity is, and, and Bell Hooks talks about, or talked about this, right? Lots of, lots of scholars talk about how can we be caregivers? How can we be um, nurturing? How can we think about a masculinity? A lot of the South African scholarship on masculinities um, tries to think, you know, how can we reframe masculinity that, that is more nurturing and not associate it to, to, to money? Right, and and I, I would argue that certainly, and in my ASR article, right, the crisis of black masculinity, a lot of that you see in the masculinities literature generally, right, not just the South African, but but African and and um, uh, U.S. urban sociology literature. Um, so the positionality, you're absolutely right, 
and um, the the vendors, and in fact, the vendors was more more ethnography, and and the orators because of access was more interviews. I mean, I went to the 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 Sorbonne, this this kind of um, um, amphitheater space, and I I you know I, I sat there and I took my notes, and and I did you know have some some closer interlocutors, but by and large. Um, precisely for what you identified was the, the class location, the educational achievements. I think that there was more tension of me as, you know, somebody achieving something that they felt entitled to. And I shouldn't just say they felt, they should have been entitled to, right? But the bottom fell out. And so they had master's degrees, they had MBAs, they had law degrees, and they were underemployed, um, working, you know, hustling, hustling propaganda um, for, for the political party instead of having the jobs that they anticipated. And here I was, this PhD student coming from the US, you know, having all of these entitlements and certainly, um, again, to, to draw on Isabel, this idea of the, the romantic partner, right? I think that there was a little bit more tension there, whereas for, for the vendors, maybe my universe was so outside of their scope that there wasn't the same kind of, um, and, and there, was some, there were some real tensions in some of the interviews um, between, um, with them and the, I mean, they would, they would come, some of them, many of them actually. I mean, I, I went through some very thick novels waiting for the interviews to begin. I would have people show up like two hours late um, and it kind of like, this is my time and you need to wait for me. And I would just sit there, you know, and, and read the book um, because they, I, I think that they wanted me to know that, that um, I'm valuable. And, and this is my time and I'm, I'm a professional and, you know, and, and in some way for, for both the vendors who were the aspiring musicians and, and the orators who, who were the, you know, the, the intellectuals and the aspiring politicians, some of them, um, or at least, you know, aspiring businessmen, that it was, um, it, it was, it, it, it was a sense of validation me wanting to to know about their lives but then there was the tension that it could be both validating but it also could be emasculating right because of again the positionality issues um of of not just class but also gender right of of the fact that i was out of place in in that sense um so then the the next point and i should be trying looking at the time as well um, but the, the extent cut off from the global economy, I mean, that's that's a, a quick one, right? I mean, it's really the, the these were media imaginaries that really drove um, the, the ideas. I mean, there there were certainly circuits, um, political circuits for the, the orators, but they by I mean, the, the, the men I, I spoke to did not really have connections in the diaspora. I mean, you certainly have people who who are, are going and, and, you know, there's a um, I actually reviewed her book, um, uh, Julia Ju Julie Kleinman's uh, uh, Adventure uh, Adventure Capital. Um, so so the men they were I mean she had captured a population who had I mean by the fact that her work was in Paris that they had migrated right um, and so th th that was tapping into networks of much more people who had migrated. Um, but for, for me, I mean, if you go the other end, for every person who, who migrates, there's a lot more who, who, right? And so I was talking to the a lot more who, who didn't and really didn't know people so much. So even um, Sasha Newell's book um, from 2012, um, The Modernity Buff, uh, where he does speak about, you know, uh, and, and I mean, there's a, a lot of West African um, literature that, that looks at this Didier Gondola's work, um, Tropical Cowboys, but he also has work on Sappers. Um, how, and, and actually I'll just borrow from him this 1999 article because it's you know now how many years ago, um, but he does mention that kind of the myth of the greatness of leaving is, is, has been destroyed by enough people having come back. He looks at, at Congo, but at the same time, people will still do everything they can. And Newell talks about this in his 2012 book to kind of hide the struggle and make it seem like it's really great. Um, but again, I mean, I, I would speak to people who um, I, I mentioned in the, 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 the postscript, they whack lyrical about, you know, the visa 
And it was, it was kind of a, this kind of like love story imaginary of I'm going to meet that person in the internet over, or, or online, or I'm going to, to meet them on a, on a trip and then they're going to sponsor me. Right. And do you know anyone, I mean, the amount of conversations I had with people who do you know any contacts at the U S embassy and how can I get there? But, but they themselves did not have those, those networks. Um, and so for, for Sasha, um, I think that uh, I'm going to collapse your questions into the, the kind of um, the, the question or, or the comment about, you know, the, the challenge for the work and what kind of challenge um, does it pose for, for racial capitalism. And I'll just say three things that actually stem a little bit from, from Isabel's comments and your comments. And then I'll just add um, one as far as the, the site. But gender is an obvious one, right? I mean, most of the, the work on race, well, actually I'll add one more um, point, but so, so racial capitalism, when it has spoken about gender, I think it's overwhelmingly spoken about um, for, for good reason about women and women's bodies in the slave economy and how women's bodies were used to reproduce um, literally as, as sites of, of, of reproduction of, of capital, right, um, through, through the violence directed against them. And so looking at masculinity is something I haven't seen so much. Um, and so the point that, you know, a lot of, again, the, the African masculinities literature and the urban sociology literature in, in U.S. space, looking at breadwinning, looking at crisis of masculinity, underemployment, all of these things, um, I think it's important to locate that within the imperial history of what is breadwinning, right? What does it mean to even say that breadwinning and so even the scare quotes of crisis is, is it really a crisis that, or, or should be reframe what masculinity should be? What should be aspirational for masculinity? And so this idea of saying, okay, um, breadwinning is actually a product of racial capitalism is something that I think is an important um, intervention. And in doing so, it's something that links um, and, and the literature on racial capitalism, again, for good reason, has largely talked about resistance, Black radical tradition, like the violence is directed in the, the resistance and not hegemony and not consent and complicity. And so connecting how both gender and race are actually competing and, and borrowing from, from Hall on Gramsci, right? That he, where he talks about class and race, but I talk about race and gender, is that you have competing um, kind of identities and ideologies within one body, <laughs> right? And so the desire for patriarchy is a very, very strong desire that can then override even the, as the structural um, that, that um, uh, Jason mentioned, right? The, the structure and agency, this is actually a conflict of the structure of racial capitalism and the agency of patriarchy, right? Um, coming together, um, clashing. And then the two, two other things I'll say about what I think I contribute is, and, and this is um, certainly I'm not the only one doing this, and I, I would hesitate to say I'm the only one doing any of this, right? Um, but um, there, is, there is a thrust of, of scholars who are looking at racial capitalism in Africa, but historically, um, it, it has been centered around diaspora, right? And and sometimes there is much there is a privileging of diaspora and and this idea of this identity that is forged through the transatlantic passage that it does so to almost erase um, the role of racial capitalism in Africa and not the palimpsest that that Walter Rodney um, so wonderfully captures with how Europe underdeveloped Africa that one begot imperialism begot slavery begot colonialism begot you know and and you have to look at this this palimpsest and there can be a danger sometimes of then creating Africa as this imaginary right on, on the part of, of of diaspora and and not actually engaging with Africa as, as a real lived um, um, ongoing project of racial capitalism, that it didn't end with, um, with the transatlantic slave passage, but it actually continued with colonialism. It continued with structural adjustment. It continued with, with all of these other um, um, articulations. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, and the, again, um, I think uh, I, I thank you, uh, Sasha, for for bringing this out. That really, this relationship between culture, culture, and political economy um, is something that that I'm I'm trying to do with with thinking about racial capitalism, and that certainly, you know, the the perpetual fight that the 
that seems to always be one-sided with Marxist versus post-colonial theorists who are always saying like, you don't understand political economy when they're saying, no, we're just saying culture is important. Um, but it, it tries to weave that together with understanding, um, thinking about racial capitalism and, and blackness that is negation in the pursuit of capital accumulation, right? So it's the negation of race in the pursuit of accumulation of capital and it always has been. Um, so that's what I'll say about um, um, Sasha's. And then um, to, to Isabel's question, so the international development, um, absolutely. And Jordana, maybe just a few minutes so that okay. if other people, there are other questions or a little bit of a follow-up. I know it's, it's fascinating. And I know the two of you are close, so that you will be able to definitely exchange. Absolutely. OK, so let me see if there's, um, if I can do very, very quickly. Um, let me see. So first, uh, the religion, um, I'll say um, there was the orators actually really drew on religion. Simone Bagbo, who was the, the wife of, of the president at the time, um, and the, that couple, they were hugely like Pentecostal. Um, orators sometimes call themselves pastor, that kind of thing. But um, that, that there's a literature and I, I think that's less important for this conversation than the fact that there is a literature that's really interesting that actually looks at how the rise of religion really draws on this idea of kind of entrepreneurialism and this idea of respectable masculinity um, with these mega churches that you see in Nigeria, in Ghana, um, of, of entrepreneurs and, and drawing on actually a lot of these same um, logics and, and kind of like this idea of like respectable um, black masculinity, but that you become a businessman and, and that kind of thing. Um, as far as non-Western um, traditions, so, you know, my site of Abidjan is actually purposeful because that is where you have the blending on the idea of the modern coming together. And so, but but even with the Cologne statues that also is the cover of the book, I like to show how um, the tradition is subsumed into these, these very contemporary narratives of modernity of, of capitalism. Um, and so the story I tell of the Cologne statues, um, it, I, I, I try to do that, but I am much more focused on the, the city because it is the site of modernity and not the site of tradition and that aspiration to be modern and also the history of Abidjan. I mean, it really is, French is the lingua franca. You know, that is the language of the marketplace. Um, and a lot of people, all they know is Abidjan. And so I think that it, it's stronger there than, than maybe other sites that you might find. And then finally, um, you know, international development, absolutely, I've talked about that in, in other work about uh, women as the, the ideal subjects, but, but certainly um, with the orators, I mean, they do draw on these global narratives, again, of entrepreneurialism and consumerism, which is um, kind of the new narrative of, of kind of like neoliberal development. Um, and then they do things like they talk about um, cocoa, we're the number one cocoa producer, and draw on a lot of these developmental scripts um, that were really important for understanding the ascent and the hegemony, but that moves to understanding that despite the neocolonial history. And I think that's actually the reason for the shift to the Anglophone and not the Francophone is trying to make sense of, well, why did this fail when this was the narrative of our success? And so maybe it was just done wrong. But it's not that the problem was essentially that connection, that global connection, but it's that we had these, you know, this, this, the, the wrong, I mean, and this is what uh, one of the quotes I have for the orators is that we were colonized by the wrong um, by, by the wrong powers, um, which is highly problematic. But but I do think it's because when you're a regional hegemon and you were a regional hegemon because you were a neocolonial state, and then you're trying to push away the neocolonial, then how do you articulate still maintaining that sense of, of superiority? Right. Awesome. And I will remind everyone this she Jordana did not see comments ahead of time and had a brilliant response to this and could talk obviously more. Um, also, yes, John, please. So, so I'll start. Um, well, just let me say this has been just such an amazing panel. And uh, so I just want to thank all of y'all uh, for just giving us all so much food to food for thought. Um, and uh, Jordana, this will probably be a rambling comment, but um, <laughs> I just want to just say what's on my mind. So. 
One of the things that um, I think about a lot when I read uh, your, your your work, including your your uh, ASR in this book as well, is my father and my father-in-law, who are very similar in the sense that they're like these like you know black entrepreneurs, you know you know small-time entrepreneurs, and, and and it means so much to them. And, and um, I, I, I see you know it's a it's a story very similar to what you tell that that they've been shut out in so many other ways that even that even though entrepreneurship doesn't really make them a lot of money it brings them um a lot of a, a, a sense of empowerment and so i guess i'm wondering here about the question of how do um i think you tell such a a beautiful story of why people buy into the system um, and, and, and uh, I guess I'm wondering here uh, about what models have you seen, what living models have you seen of people sort of um, uh, coming out of that? Uh, uh, you know, uh, just like you said earlier, um, we want to teach, uh, uh, we want to cultivate different kinds of identities. Uh, and what, have you seen any models for that? Because uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I remember dealing with my niece, and telling, uh, you know, trying to be more um, mindful about a gender and, and, and sort of not, you know, not calling her princess and things like that. And it always occurred, it always occurred to me that none of the things that I thought up to replace that uh, were as resonant with her. Um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, and so then sort of uh, applying that to my father and my, my father-in-law, who are these old men and who, you know, are, you know, are more baked, uh, or, you know, these are cakes that are more baked. Um, so, so, so I, will, so I, I just want to know, you know, I'm sure that you've talked about this in a book a little bit, but just what are your general thoughts about that, uh, about that problem? Uh, thank you for that. What a wonderful, and I'm assuming that's actually going to have to be a closing question um, with the, the time. So what a wonderful closing question. Um, so, you know, um, I, I mean, obviously we see models of that all the time, right? And even in one body, we see models of that. So I'm sure that your father and, you know, at, at different moments is is articulating things beyond, you know, the entrepreneurial identity. And, and certainly, you know, research shows that, you um, I'm not sure if it's black men or, or men of color generally, um, but certainly black men um, spend more time in in rituals with like the the family uh, with their children, like bathing them and you know the childcare, like those those kinds of um, things that that um, uh, white men or you know they're they're less likely to associate with fatherhood, and so you do see that right. Um, but, and so I think that uh, having more of an emphasis on, you know, if, and it's, and it's women, it's, it's, it's partners, right? It's not just like the, the breadwinner, but it's also the expectation that if I'm successful, I should marry a breadwinner, you know, and that, you know, even if I work and, and certainly black women work and always have worked, right? But, but not that he's a deadbeat if he's a stay at home father, right? And, and, and I definitely see, you know, in the academy of, 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 of scholars who, whose work I, 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 I speak to and I engage who do masculinity studies. Um, when I, I speak to them, they, they model these, these beautiful families, right? Um, and, and beyond that, not just the, the people I speak to. Um, one thing I will say as a plug, and I think that maybe her work is, is doing, um, might, might um, be really engaging for, for what you're thinking through is Saida Grundy's new book coming out in, in I believe, August uh, called Respectable that looks at um, Morehouse, uh, the Morehouse man and the, the creation of the Morehouse man and how the idea of being a respectable black man um, connects to certain class and gender ideologies. So I think that that might really be something for, for you to check out with, with these kinds of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordana. And what, what a testament to your spirit and your brilliance to be plugging other people's work at the end of the session that was to be dedicated to you. This was so stimulating. It's very hard to go in the outside world, uh, not think about what, what happened here. And your portrayal of economic lives um, of these men uh, is so astute and, and moving. In, in many different ways. So I, like I said, I hope the book prospers and your family prospers and look forward to actually meeting you in person uh, when an opportunity arises. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our wonderful panelist, Isabel Pike, 
Jason Jackson and uh, Sasha White uh, on behalf of the organizers of the mini conference. John Robinson and myself are here. Others are here in spirit. Uh, I think this is a terrific ending of our first day and there is more to come. So stick around. Thank you. Thank you so very much.